Welcome to episode eight of the Smart Leader Cell Podcast. I am Jessica Lorimer, your hostess and sales coach, leadership expert, and the person who is the most excited to talk to you today about something I really love. Now, you may not know this about me, but I'm a total psychology geek, okay? I love knowing why people do the things they do. I love knowing why people behave in the way that they behave. And so today I want to talk about the psychology behind the reason that people buy and subsequently what that means for you as a seller. Now, this is a really juicy topic because we are all different in terms of the way that we react to sales and that we react to being pitched to. It depends on a lot of things, okay? It depends on the way that we've been sold to before. Did we have favorable buying experiences? You know, were they good experiences? Did we enjoy it? Was it pleasurable? Or alternatively, and this is what most people experience, was it a hard sell? Did it feel gross? Did it feel slimy? Did it make us feel not good? Did it make us, even though we purchased something, feel negative about the way that we were sold to or the way that we interacted with the person who ultimately helped us purchase the product? Now, it's really interesting because in the online world and indeed in in the regular sales world, there are generally three main ways that people sell or identify with being sold to. So that's what we're going to cover off today. These three main types of selling, who they appeal to, and how you can identify if you are that kind of seller. And more importantly, if that's the way that you should be selling to your buyers and if they resonate with it. So let's dive straight in. <laughs> I'm saying that as I'm doing a little shoulder dance. You guys can't see it, but I am. <laughs> so one of the first ways, and this is probably the most common sales tactic that we see in the online space, is aspirational selling. Now, when we talk about aspirational selling, I'm talking, of course, about the people who have Instagrammable lives. I am not one of those people. Okay, to put it into perspective, last week I put a charcoal face mask on my face. It said 10 minutes on the bottle somehow 40 minutes went past and I, <laughs> I only realized when I went to take a sip of my water and I was like, oh my goodness, I have grayscale. It was like I'd gone into Game of Thrones and got this kind of crazy stone person uh, disease. Then I realized obviously it was my face mask. So my life is not necessarily Instagrammable, but in the online space, aspirational selling is really popular. And the way that you can identify aspirational selling is, does this, does this make me feel like I would like this person's life, this person's business? Do I feel like that is something that I want to aspire to or that motivates me? Okay. So typical examples that you see of this are really popular with online business coaches, you know, who are talking about the laptop lifestyle. So typically their branding is usually very much around, I'm sitting on the beach, I've got my laptop here, I've got my cocktail in hand, life is really good, it's sunny, it's warm, you know, and it's easy. And that tends to be the, one of the key signs of an aspirational seller, somebody who is using their life and the way that their life works or the way that their business works to be aspirational, to inspire, to motivate, and to encourage people to buy from them. So what happens when this person sells? Well, it's pretty simple. They build up their content with things that are designed to attract you. Okay. So they will Instagram photos of their life. They will put out content that talks about something that they know is really going to resonate with their ideal clients. So sometimes you'll see um, photos of brand new Chanel bags and people going, oh my goodness, I walked into Chanel today and I just bought this and you know, life is good because I was able to buy this. I didn't have to worry about it. It's something that I'd always dreamed of and never really thought would happen, but now it has. Okay. Now, I'm not judgy on any of these three ways of selling, FYI. Um, and I think we all do them at different times. So be aware that the way that you sell can change and the way that your buyers respond 
mean that sometimes you will naturally change your selling style in order to help more people, in order to serve more people. And that's okay. But the key identifiers of this um, sales type, of this aspirational sales type, is that they are going to appeal to you as their ideal client. They're going to show you things that they are experiencing now that they've had the breakthrough or that their transformation has um, kind of arrived and they've shifted and things look different. And they're going to use that to sell to you. Okay, so their content is going to be very much Instagrammable. It's going to be very aspirational, very motivational. And their sales pitches are going to be around, if you want to achieve what I have achieved, you need to purchase from me. Okay, because they are directly appealing to that aspirational part of you that thinks, yes, I want to be just like that. I want to be that size. I want to have that boyfriend. I want to have that lifestyle. I want to have that kind of business. And they are directly looking for people who identify with the life that they are living or the business that they have or the fitness regime that they love. And they are selling you that based on what it has done for them. Okay. Now, as integrity goes, actually, if done well, aspirational selling has a lot of integrity because it simply is showing people what is possible. Okay, what is possible for them if they do the work, if they show up, if they work hard. Now, where aspirational selling can go wrong is where we see false examples, you know, and there are plenty of those on the internet. So I'll let you go and find some for yourself um, (laughs) because sometimes they can be quite entertaining. But, you know, aspirational selling goes wrong when somebody is trying to make you to aspire to something that they don't necessarily have. Okay, so if, if somebody's telling you, I'm making 10K a month, but you know, they're living in a a bus shelter, it may not be likely that that person is making 10K a month and therefore they're selling you down the aspirational route when actually it's not something they've attained themselves. Okay, so if you are somebody who buys aspirationally, i.e. if you are somebody who looks at somebody else's business, somebody else's lifestyle and buys into, I wish my life was like that, be aware that you will need to do your due diligence, you know, make sure these people's lives really are what they say they are, you know, make sure that they are the real deal and that they can help you achieve the transformation that you're looking for before you go and plonk a load of money into their wallet. Okay. So that's the first one. That's aspirational selling. Now, as I briefly mentioned there, if you're an aspirational buyer, you are somebody who typically purchases based on wanting to achieve a level of business or lifestyle that somebody else has achieved. So if you are currently on a sales no-go, i.e. you're like, I don't want to buy any more courses or shiny objects right now, it might be worth unfollowing. (laughs) It might be worth hitting that unfollow button and being like, okay, do I really, really need to see Louis Vuitton heels in my newsfeed every day? Is it going to make me spend a ton of money that I don't want to be spending right now? And if it is, it's okay to hit the unfollow button just until after Christmas. Okay, I promise it's okay. Now, the second type of selling or sales style, also popular in the online space, is the fear of missing out. Okay, now this is a really big one in the online space because what tends to happen when we sell online is that we are all in groups. We are all in communities. We all make networks and we meet friends very, very easily in the online world. And so if we perceive one of our colleagues or peers or friends to be doing a course, it automatically gives us justification that we're like, oh, if that person's doing it, of course I need to do it because I'm at the same level in business as them. And if I don't do it and they get great results, I'm going to have missed out. Okay. Who else has been there? Because Let me tell you, I'm there pretty much every day of the week. I am a FOMO buyer. (laughs) Those countdown timers on sales pages get me every day of the week because I'm like, oh no, oh gosh, in seven days, I'm going to lose my opportunity to buy this and then it's going to be gone and all of the people who bought it are going to have epic, epic results and I'm just going to be left behind. I'm going to be lagging um, at the back of the line. So I feel you, okay? If you are a FOMO buyer, I absolutely feel you. Now, if you're a fear of missing out kind of seller, and this will depend 
very, very much on your audience. Okay. Fear of missing out sellers. It's not just dependent on your personality. It's also dependent on your following because if you have zero following, it's really hard for you to kind of, um, create a campaign where you create that urgency and that FOMO because you don't have anyone there. Okay. So if you're a fear of missing out seller, you are quite likely defined by the fact that you love a countdown timer. Okay. You love urgency. You love highlighting when people have bought into your product program or service. Now there are ways of doing this and, and some of the most likely ones that you will see online in Facebook groups tend to be if somebody has um, purchased a program, that person, the seller, will welcome them in or welcome them publicly in some way. So it might be a post on their business page, in their Facebook group, on Twitter, however it, however they want to do it. And yes, I have done this on occasion. I am a fear of missing out seller. If I think that something will genuinely benefit my community, I'm going to tell everybody about it and I'm publicly going to celebrate the people who do take action. So I've definitely done this, right? But typically what will happen is that person, the seller, will publicly celebrate the people who have purchased. Now, this does two things. One, it reassures the person who's purchased. They feel really good because they're like, oh, I'm getting recognition that I'm an action taker and that I'm doing the right thing. And actually, that's really positive. Okay, that's really positive because as a buyer, you feel validated, you feel valued, and it just makes you solidify that decision in your head that it was the right decision to make. And that's a good thing. The second thing that it does is that it shows other people publicly that people are purchasing your products. Okay. So as the seller, it shows that people are purchasing your products and services and that they are publicly happy to be, you know, to, for the world to kind of see that they are identifying with what you're selling and that they are ready to take action. And therefore the people who consider themselves, their peers, their colleagues, people who are perhaps further ahead, um, or even in some cases further behind, will want to get to that level, will want to be with that person, you know, and have the same results. Okay. So that's typically what you're going to see from somebody who is a fear of missing out seller. Okay. You're going to see those urgency or those key motivators to buy. So it might be public calling out in terms of this person just bought my program. That's amazing. It might be publicly asking somebody, and this works really well if you have a product or a service that is run on an evergreen basis where you publicly get that person to request access to join the, um, private community for your paid service by going into your free community and saying, Hey, I just need to request access to this great course or this um, private Facebook community for this course. And that works well because it drives traffic to your evergreen funnel. Um, so that can just be, you know, a little side note there. I'm just going to give you some funnel tips today too. <laughs> but again, that can drive that fear of missing out because obviously when somebody's coming in and saying, Hey, I just bought this and I'm really excited and I want to get into the free group uh, or the paid community. Sorry. It means that other people are seeing it and going, Oh, what am I missing out on? What am I not seeing? Maybe I haven't seen the program. Maybe I haven't seen the, you know, the funnel that leads to it. And I really want to now. Okay. So if you are a FOMO seller, those are some of the things that are going to really embody your character. Those are some of the things that people are going to see time and again when they purchase from you. Now, the thing about selling from a perspective of using the fear of missing out method is that you cannot do it all the time. Um, because your audience gets burned, you know, they, they get tired of seeing it and they're like, Oh, Oh, there's no more urgency. Okay. So if you have something that is running on evergreen, it's good not to do this all the time. Okay. You can't do the same things all the time with a fear of missing out strategy because actually people just get desensitized. You know, they, they don't care anymore. They're like, Oh, whatever. <laughs> Another person's bought it. That's great. Cool. Whatever. And as time goes by, you find that it's not working in the same way. So people who are fear of missing out sellers tend to have open cut launches. So they open the car on a specific day and they close the car on another specific day so that they can drive as much urgency as they want to that program or service. That doesn't necessarily mean that the program or service is run on a live basis, but it does mean 
that the launch for it is live. Okay, everything is live for the launch. So that's fear of missing out. And if you are a fear of missing out type buyer, some of the things that you might experience, we've already highlighted the fact that if one of your friends or peers buys into something, you are probably going to buy into it because you want to get the same results they do. You don't want to be left behind. You're probably going to be somebody who um, checks the countdown time regularly. Interestingly enough, people who are fear of missing out buyers do not tend to be early bird buyers. Okay, so just a fun fact for you there. Statistically, people who buy, um, with, who have a fear of missing out, tend to buy at the last minute. Because what will happen is psychologically their brain is going, we need something to tip us over the edge. Give us the trigger. Send us the message. Give us the last sign. So if you're a fear of missing out buyer, and I am, I am a, a huge fear of missing out buyer on occasion, then you really do wait for that countdown timer to hit and you are somebody who will buy in those last hours, which means that if you're a fear of missing out seller or you have a community or um, people in your community who embody these kinds of qualities as a buyer, you really do need to utilize those last hours of your launch. Because although you might be thinking, oh, there's no point, I'm really tired, launching is hard, um, you actually are at a pivotal point in your launch where you can pick up quite a few last minute sales. Okay. So it's really, really important to recognize those things that if you're a fear of missing out kind of buyer, the kinds of triggers that are going to help support you making a buying decision. And if you are a fear of missing out seller, or you have buyers in your community who are triggered by the fear of missing out qualities that you start putting preparations in place for your launches so that you can catch those people even right at the end of the process. Okay. Now the final sales style and the final buying style that we're going to be talking about today is <laughs> it's one that gets a really bad rep in the industry, um, in the online world. Now this is a sales style that you don't tend to see that often in the corporate world. And the reason for that is that corporate businesses tend to rely much more heavily on testimonials, on reputation, on uh, proven results. And so they actually don't always go in for these archetypes. You know, they, they don't necessarily go in for fear of missing out selling. They sometimes, you know, you'll find that they do go in for aspirational type sales strategies. So particularly with luxury fashion brands or anything like that, you'll find that they have that key link to aspirational selling styles. But this final sales style and buying style is not one that you would see in the corporate world. And it is pretty much exclusive to uh, businesses that are run by solopreneurs, entrepreneurs, online business owners, and anybody who is building a personal brand in their business. So we're going to touch on emotional selling. Now, I will be the first person to admit that I am not the biggest fan. In fact, I am generally not a fan of emotional selling. Um, and there are a couple of reasons for that. One, personally, I am not an emotional buyer. So, and we're going to talk about the qualities in, in detail later. Being an emotional buyer, just as an FYI, does not mean that you cry your way through the purchase. <laughs> um, we will be talking about it. But in terms of my buying personality, I'm not an emotional buyer. I don't buy because I'm emotionally connected in some way to the person selling the product or service. I don't buy for that reason. Like we talked about earlier, I'm an aspirational buyer. I buy because I want what that person has achieved or what that person has done in terms of results. Or I can be a fear of missing out buyer. I can buy because my colleagues and peers are doing things and I know that if they are doing those things, it would probably be quite a good step up or a challenge for me too. In the online space specifically, we've seen a rise of emotional sales tactics over the last three years, certainly the last three years that I've been in business. And one of the reasons that it does get such a bad rep is because people misuse this sales strategy. It is the most common misused sales strategy in the online space, I would say at the moment. And the reason for that is emotional selling and emotional buying is defined by somebody being triggered to buy something as a result of having a deep emotional connection with that person, 
and therefore with their product or service. Now, in a world of integrity-based sales, that's a really positive thing, i.e. we're going along the lines of, we buy from people that we know, like, and trust. Now, obviously, it's really, really easy to increase somebody's trust in you and to build a deeper connection and relationship with a person or prospective buyer when you are able to show them some level of vulnerability and when you are able to take yourself off the pedestal and when you are able to um, connect them deeper with your story, with your mission, your vision, and your purpose. Now, when you're selling with integrity, Emotional sales is a good strategy for people building a personal brand because it means that you can align people together with your mission, with your vision, with your purpose that you are trying to achieve at the same time as helping them build a better relationship with you and buy safe in the knowledge that they're doing the right thing. However, it does get misused and the online world has had a spate over the last couple of years of people pimping their pain for profit. And that's really, for me, frankly, it's just disgusting. Um, it's, it's absolutely aberrant that anybody would pimp out their pain or indeed um, pain suffered by you know, their friends or family in order to manipulate people into buying from them. <laughs> I just realized how polarizing this podcast has got. And for me, it's, it's a real filter. I think emotional selling when done well can be very powerful. It can establish relationships. It can establish the no like trust factor. It can establish true leadership. It can show your audience that you are vulnerable. It can show them that you are still a leader. It can show them you're still knowledgeable. It can help them trust you. It can help them build a deeper connection with you. When done in a manipulative manner, it can be very, very detrimental to your audience in that they may be buying things that are not right for them and therefore they don't get the results that they want. Now, the difficulty is that emotional selling and aspirational selling can often look very similar, okay? So if you are an emotional type buyer, um, and that means, like I said earlier, it doesn't mean that you cry at everything, right? But it does mean that you buy primarily based on the story of somebody and the relationship you have rather than necessarily looking at all of the pros and cons and going, do I really need to make this investment right now? You look at the person, you look at their story, you look at the relationship you have with them and you say, based on those things, I want to make the purchase of this course or product or service. In terms of selling, aspirational selling and emotional selling actually look fairly similar because as we talked about earlier, aspirational selling is very much about utilizing your personal brand. It's very much about showing people your life. It's about showing them the present, the here, the now. So is emotional selling. But the difference is that your audience will be left with an entirely different taste in their mouth if it is done in the wrong way. So for example, aspirational selling done in the right way makes somebody think, oh wow, this person is living in the present, they're living in the here and now, I really want to buy from them because I want to achieve the same results or have the same lifestyle. Emotional selling, when done in the right way, makes people say, ah, I know this person, I trust them, I like them, I'm going to ask them whether or not this product or service is right for me, and if they say yes, I'm going to purchase it. Okay, so emotional selling is not about you know, it's not about having an ill-informed audience. It's about opening up the process for your audience to make an informed decision about whether this is the right option for them. Okay. So we still welcome questions. It's still about educating your audience. It's still about them making the right decision for them. Emotional selling done in the wrong way will leave your audience feeling something like this. Okay. So here's the typical Facebook post that goes up. Insert sad situation here. Five years ago, I experienced this. It was the worst thing that has ever happened to me. X, Y, Z person, and you will often find that in bad emotional selling, blame is often attributed to a different party, made me feel like this. However, I did overcome it, and now here I am. So the model is similar to aspirational selling in that 
it will take them through a breakdown and a breakthrough. However, with bad emotional selling, with emotional selling that is designed to be manipulative, it's very much focused on pain. Everything is focused on the pain or the trauma of a specific situation. With positive emotional selling or with even aspirational selling in some points, it's about the learning experience. Okay, so the difference between a good emotional seller, somebody that's selling with integrity and somebody that is aware of the power they hold when it comes to the relationships they've built with their community and the difference between somebody who is manipulating people for money is are they sharing the learning experience or are they simply pimping their pain for profit and sharing a painful experience, a traumatic experience for nothing other than sympathy? Now, you've got to make your own mind up about how that comes across to you. There are some people who really do have tragic, tragic stories. And I've, I've met many people online who've had terribly traumatic um, pasts who have gone on to be incredibly aspirational and inspirational people. There are other people online who I have met who have, you know, for want of a better phrase, I'm just going <laughs> to just going to keep using this phrase in this, this episode, have pimped their pain for profit and who have not delivered as they've promised. And I think it's very, very irresponsible to mess with people's emotions. I think it's very, very manipulative. And I think if you are an emotional seller, your responsibility is always to leave your door open so that your audience can ask you questions. Okay, so if you're an emotional seller, i.e. if most of your content is around your story, your learning experiences, your breakthroughs, your journey, expressing your um, vulnerability, sharing your celebrations, that kind of thing, please make sure that when you are selling, the door is open for your audience to ask questions. That when they come to you and honestly say, hey, Jess, is this really the right decision for me? you assess it honestly and you say yes or no based on your expert opinion rather than your mortgage payment, okay? With great power comes great responsibility. And in all honesty, the emotional seller has possibly the most power out of any kind of sales strategy out there or any kind of sales psychology out there because they have built a strong, really, really strong foundation to a relationship. And people want to continue that, okay? You're, you, you do have the power to say no to clients if it's not right for them. Now, if you're an emotional buyer and you know that you connect with people really strongly and you think, yes, I really want to work with this person, it is your job to do your due diligence, not necessarily around the person, because the likelihood is if you're an emotional buyer, you've been following them for a long time, you know them well, you have um, you know, experienced highs and lows with them, you've been on the journey, and you feel really good about this person. But you've got to be doing due diligence around what they're selling. So asking yourself the question, do I really need this product, program, or service right now? Am I actually going to put it into practice, i.e. am I going to implement what I'm learning? Am I going to use it? Is it something that's going to generate some kind of ROI in my life, in my business, in my health, etc.? And if the answer to any of those is no, take a step back and think about whether you're ready to buy now or whether actually you need to wait for the right product that they're selling to come along. Okay. Now, <laughs> I hate to be a Debbie Downer because it's emotional selling when done well and when done with the integrity, honestly, is, is one of the best types of sales experiences out there. It can make people feel incredibly connected to you. It can make people feel like they have this really amazing relationship. And actually you do generate these incredible connections that you do not always see from other types of selling perspectives. You just have to be really sensible about how you use it. You have to have clear boundaries about who you will and will not work with. And you have to be very, very honest about whether, you know, not about whether somebody should make the decision. Ultimately, them making the decision to buy is up to them. But you have to have absolute integrity when somebody comes to you and asks. And the definition of an emotional buyer is that they will want to ask you. They will want your opinion because they value you. They value you, they value your opinion, and they want you to 
you know, reassure them that what they're doing is, is what's best for them because of the relationship they have with you. Okay, so just be very, very aware of that when you're an emotional seller or an emotional buyer. So that's the three types of sellers and buyers that we primarily see in the online space. Now, there are many more. Okay, there are many, many more archetypes out there. There are many, many different ways of selling and buying. But those are the three that we primarily see online and everything else, every other category really is kind of derived from those main three. So when we look at these kinds of categories and when we look at what kind of seller we are and what kind of buyer we are, it's really important to mention that you will not necessarily be the same kind of buyer as you are seller. Okay, you may be somebody who is a fear of missing out buyer and you really like to be included in a community, you know, and you really want to be on the button when it comes down to what your colleagues, what your peers are purchasing. But you may be an aspirational seller because you may be that far ahead of your audience that actually they're looking at your lifestyle, they're looking at your relationships and thinking, I really want that too. It's also worth mentioning that the kind of seller you are really, really is a lot about the way that your buyers react to you. Okay. If you have a ton of buyers in your audience who are fear of missing out buyers and you don't feel comfortable selling in that way, you need to get used to it. Okay. Now that might be really harsh, but you need to step up to the plate and realize that you may be leaving a lot of money on the table. You may be leaving a lot of clients on the table by not implementing some of the basics um, and the basic strategies behind those uh, psychological behaviors. Because what you don't want to do is have people miss out on getting the results that they really want, or worse, going and buying from somebody who doesn't have as much integrity as you and who perhaps can't help them get the same results that you can just because they listened to their audience's behavior, they took note of their audience's behavior, and they responded accordingly. Okay? Now, the other thing is you may want to bring in different styles and your style will evolve over time. There are times in my business when, and certainly there are products in my business that sell much better with a fear of missing out sales strategy than an aspirational one and vice versa. There have even been times in my business where I have used emotional selling. It's been very, very few and far between because it's not a style that I enjoy sales wise. It's not a style that my audience enjoys particularly, and it's not a style that I use in terms of my own buying decisions. So it is very, very few and far between, but I've got clients who use that hugely successfully, um, day after day after day. So it doesn't matter. There are, you know, there are many positives to each of these styles and there are many negatives to each of these styles. We have all experienced many of those. Okay. The important thing to recognize is that you need to be responsible for the integrity of how you sell. Integrity is always up to you. Do not take clients that you can't handle. Do not take clients that you can't deliver to. Do not sell in a way that makes you feel uncomfortable. And don't sell in a way that's going to make your audience feel gross or slimy either, because that's not what it's about. The sales experience should be really positive and you should be leaning on your skills, your expertise, and looking at what it is that is inspiring or motivating your audience to buy from you and leveraging that. Because done with integrity, there is nothing wrong with that at all. So there you have it. Those are the three main selling styles that we see online. It's how you can identify yourself as a specific type of buyer so that you can choose to buy in an informed way and the three types of seller that you may be and how you can really use those um, archetypes to sell effectively and to sell with integrity and more importantly, to sell successfully. So if you've enjoyed this episode, if you enjoyed what you've learned today, please, please hit that subscribe button on iTunes and leave a review. Let me know what you thought. I'm always really interested. You can always email me as well. If you have a big question about any of these sales styles, feel free to drop me a line. I love getting emails and I'll see you on Friday where I am bringing back the deep dive laser coaching sessions with one of my favorite entrepreneurs on the internet at the current point in time. So don't miss it. I will see you on Friday. Have a wicked week. 